Hey everyone, how's it going? Jake Norton here, uh, arguably the world's worst YouTuber. I don't think I've posted here in over a year. Um, apologies for that, but I uh, really only want to do it if I have something interesting or something fun to share. Uh, but it is the 100th anniversary of the 1924 Everest Expedition, pretty big anniversary year, so I wanted to get back into posting a few things, creating some videos and content, and what struck me, since I don't have anything earth-shattering, any huge new information to report, but I thought it might be interesting to go through some of the things I've collected over the years, some of the artifacts, because after all, the reason I have them here is they all have a story, they all have some meaning, they all tell something about these early expeditions. So uh, let's go on a tour through my office and, uh, and I'll pick out one thing I'd like to talk about today. But as I go through, if you happen to see something that you're like, man, I want to know more about that, just hit me up in the comments below. Let me know what you think, what you're interested in, and I'll try and do something later on on that. But uh, in the meantime, let's, let's go through and look at a few things. All right, everyone, so this is my uh, humble, if not a bit messy, office here in Evergreen, Colorado. Uh, nothing all that exciting, but a lot of, a lot of different things hanging out. Um, thought I'd just uh, take you through here before we get into things. So again, if you see anything you're interested in, just let me know and I'll try and do something uh, in a later story. Um, 1960 oxygen set, 1963 Everest bottle, uh, gosh, there's just lots of things, old, old bits of flotsam and jetsam everywhere, uh, books, old Tibetan salt bag, and, uh, this one's kind of interesting. This is, uh, one of the summit rocks that we pulled out of Mallory's pocket in 1999. Just kidding. Um, anyways, uh, ammonites and a whole bunch of different things all around old crampons and ice axes, 1975 oxygen bottle, uh, old tents from 38, a lot of old books on exploration and Everest history especially, uh, a lot of different artifacts all throughout here. So again, if, you, if you're seeing something that you're interested in, hit me up in the comments. But the thing that I wanted to talk about uh, today, no, that's not the camera that Mallory and Irvin carried, just for the record. Um, the thing that I wanted to talk about today is this. What is it? What does it mean? Why would I even want to talk about it? So let's get into that. All right, I hope you enjoyed that little tour of my office. So, you know, one of the things I've always loved about Mount Everest, and especially the north side of Mount Everest, is that history is right there for the looking, for the taking, for the interpretation. So much has just been left aside from those early expeditions and you can still find it today. Tune into my blog, I've got a link in the comments or the area below uh, where you can get to some of those artifacts that I've found over the years. But uh, some of them are, are like this thing. And, and what is this? Well, let's first understand where it came from. So 2001, the second Mallory and Irvin research expedition in April of that year, I was feeling a bit sick up at Advanced Base Camp, Camp 3 and I uh, decided to go down to base camp for a few days of R&R, &R. and on my way down, I had a call of nature. So I stepped off the trail off to the descender's left on the East Rongbuck Glacier, and uh, on my way back to the, to the hiking route, I came upon a meltwater pond, uh, just natural pond on the glacier, and it had a strange oblong thing sticking out of it. So I went over to investigate and found what I was pretty certain was an old oxygen bottle. Well, I was too weak at the time to chop it out, so I called up to advanced base camp on the radio to John Race and Dave Hahn and others, told them where it was, they came down and chipped out that bottle, found a bunch of others, plus some wooden uh, packing crate material, parts of old snowshoes, and part of an old crampon, and a whole mishmash of odds and ends and bits of, of cans and flotsam and jetsam and whatnot, but all of it was fascinating and told a story, and there were a bunch of these as well. And, uh, yeah, that's what we're talking about here today. So what is this thing? What is this? Let me hold it up here again. Oh, sorry, it's hard to get oriented. Well, we figured out pretty quickly that this and a lot of, a few of the others that we found, uh, well, what it is is it's a battery. So it's a battery, big deal. What's important about that? Well, it took me a long time. I had to go down a pretty deep rabbit hole over the past week to, to kind of put my hunches together, and I think I figured out what it was. 
So the 1922 expedition, really like all the pre-World War II expeditions, was uh, was kind of an all-star cast. You had these incredible people, uh, leader Teddy Roosevelt's evil twin in the center of this photo, Brigadier General Charles Granville Bruce. You had another other amazing uh, luminary climbers like Teddy Norton, Howard Somerville, George Ingle Finch, and of course George Mallory as, as members of the expedition. But one guy gets kind of left out of a lot of the history and the conversation, but he was an incredibly important member, and that guy was named John Baptist Lucius Knoll. Incredible name for an incredible guy. So in many ways, we can actually credit John Knoll with getting the whole Everest Enterprise off the ground in the first place. In 1913, when he was an army officer in, uh, in Darjeeling in northeast India, he went AWOL from his position dressed as a Tibetan pilgrim and snuck into forbidden Tibet trying to get to Mount Everest. Well, somehow with that pretty pathetic costume that he was wearing, he actually made it within 40 miles of the mountain before getting caught and sent back home. But he reported his findings to the Royal Geographic. He was the first Westerner to get within spitting distance of the mountain. And, and that eventually, after World War I, led to the founding of the Everest Committee and the 1921 Reconnaissance Expedition. And in 1922, John came along on the expedition, not really as a climber. He wasn't so much of a climber, but to do another very important thing that hadn't really been done on Himalayan expeditions before, to capture professional level still photography and also cinematography, film footage of the climb, of the expedition. And John was determined to do an expedition film of the expedition, of the climb and of the attempt on Mount Everest, which he did. And go into the comments below and you'll see a link to the BFI's rendition of the 1922 Everest expedition film. And John Knoll was not just any ordinary picture taker or amateur cinematographer. He was really a visionary individual who did things in a different way, saw things in a different light, and wasn't afraid to take big risks for what he hoped would be big gain. And a case in point to me is the 1924 expedition. When the Everest Committee was having trouble raising the funds to put the expedition together, John Knoll came to them and said, after he started his company called Explorer Films, he came to them and he said, hey, I'll give you 8,000 pounds, a lot of money in those days, to fund the expedition. And in exchange, I get ownership, rights to all the still photography and all the film footage. And he was taking a big gamble there, thinking that he could pay himself back if they managed to reach the top. Those photos and that footage would be worth a ton of money. Well, what was interesting, one of the things that John did to pay off his initial investment was he took funds from people back home in the UK, maybe 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 pounds, and in exchange for that donation, they would get this sent to them by runner from Rongbuk Base Camp back to Darjeeling, postmarked from India, and sent to them with John Knoll's message on it. Pretty amazing, and to give you an idea of how revolutionary that was or how ahead of its time, that's exactly what we did in 1999 on the first Mallory and Irvin research expedition, sent these postcards back from base camp. They didn't go by runner, they went by jeep, but hey, it was all thanks to John Knoll, those early ideas. So John was truly an innovator and a visionary in everything that he did. But anyways, back to our friendly little artifact here, back to our battery, and back to our story. So going into 1922, John Knoll knew that if he was going up high on the mountain to shoot cinematography, to shoot film footage, he needed some pretty specialized equipment. So he worked with one of the top camera makers of that time, the Newman Sinclair Company in London, to develop a special camera that would work for him on the slopes of Mount Everest. So John worked with Newman Sinclair to develop a camera system that would work perfectly for him on the upper mountain. They developed one that was light enough that it could be carried with relative ease up to 7,000 meters, 23,000 feet. John put together a special mounting plate so that it could be put on the tripod and mounted in a matter of minutes, something we take for granted today, but it was his own invention back in 1922. And perhaps most importantly, John realized that the traditional cinematography cameras that required the cinematographer to hand crank foot after foot of film through the camera, well, that wasn't going to work very well at high altitude 
in the extreme cold with mittens on, so on and so forth. So he realized he needed a motor drive. But not just any motor drive. Those had been around for a while. But what he needed was one that was powered by batteries. So he worked with Newman and Sinclair to put together a motor drive that was battery powered. And I'm pretty sure that this little battery here was one of those batteries. Because after going down the rabbit hole for a while and looking around, I finally found some documentation on the 1922 camera and pictures of its battery compartment and its motor drive and a description of how big exactly that was. And as you can see here, it would have fit two of these batteries into the compartment almost perfectly. So when we look back now on over a century of attempts to climb Mount Everest, over a century of the media that's come out of those attempts, from 1922 and 24 to 53 and 63 to White Limbo and Winds of Everest up to the modern era, well, so much of that, so much of that media and that work can be traced back to the ideas and innovations of John Knoll in 1922 and 1924. And so much of that story can be captured in one little piece of trash left on the side of the Rongbuck Glacier in 1922. So anyways, that's my story for today. I hope you all enjoyed it at least a little bit. Um, if there's other artifacts you want me to tell stories about, tell the meaning behind, uh, please let me know. Drop me a note. Put a note in the comments. I'll do my best to follow through. I'll do my best to post here a little bit more often. And uh, thank you all. Happy 100th anniversary of the 1924 expedition and all the best.